everyone. Um, this is the session of uh, Crafting Commons, um, a roundtable on Cybercraft Networks. And my name is Aphrodite Psara. Uh, I'm a media artist and it takes an e-textiles practitioner originally from Athens, Greece, but the last four years I'm based in Seattle, Washington. And um, together with Gabriel Ben Abdallah, we'll be moderating this session with uh, six other amazing practitioners. Hello, my name is Gabrielle. Um, I'm going to be co-moderator for the session. I'm a researcher and PhD student in the Department of um, Human-Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, my work deals with speculative, critical, and historical approaches to human-computer interaction. Um, I'm particularly interested in the intersection of language and computation. Um, and so this roundtable specifically is on craft and commons um, and just to talk a little bit about uh, the theme of this roundtable um, the way it sort of came together um, was uh, this uh, this interest that Aphrodite and I had on the way uh, craft communities form and also develop or produce commons and so the fact that craft practices rely on the exchange um, and transmit techniques and technical skills, tacit and explicit knowledge, but but also on the circulation of common values, um, which really fosters shared mindset and communities. And so um, we have different um, e-textile practitioners from all over the world today who are going to talk about their practice, so how it relates to these different themes of craft. Uh, cybercraft, commons, kitties. Um, and so on uh, developing these practices, they're also uh, creating cultural and, and um, cultural and intellectual commons. Um, yeah, that's that's the intro. Yeah, and um, why the specific people? I mean, um, we're all, all everyone here is a member of the e textiles community, and we're definitely like um, all in. It's a community that already exists, and there's a lot of like events every year that we meet in person. Some of the practitioners here in this panel actually. Uh, know in person from other events like the a textile summer camp or the a textile spring break or others have met in festivals or others like a more I've never met in person but um so this this event like this session here uh, is an opportunity we literally like took to heart this idea of expanding our networks in in these difficult times and places and so with this round table we wanted to bring practitioners that don't know each other's practice together so that they can like overcome the you know cultural and geographic difficulties that separate them basically and before we uh jump start with uh, its presenters uh talk um I would like to um, say that we invited the um, uh, um, the practitioners uh, Heidi Biggs, Audrey Briot, Si uh, Wei Amor Munoz, Constanza Pina, and Melissa Aguilar to um, present their work in relation to uh, some questions that we prepared to give them like a framework for their presentations. So some of these questions have to do with the notion of craft and how they understand the term in their work. Uh, how does the idea of craft relate to uh, communities and networks? Um, another topic that we uh, posed was colonization and craft. Uh, how does craft decolonize and how can it respond to colonization? Um, and, this, and this idea of cybercraft as a working term um, and the cybernetic aspect um, that relates to computation, uh, cyborgization, or virtuality. And Gabrielle uh, wants to add some things about commons, I think. 
Yeah, uh, this idea of commons, which like features in the title of the, the roundtable. So um, I think it maybe it's worth just to define a little bit what commons, um, or at least how we understand commons as um, share resources that aren't owned by anyone um, in particular, but really belong to to a people, to a community. And so um, traditionally, commons can be understood as natural shared resources, and it can be as broad as like space or the sea or air. Um, Sometimes some sim lens, there are still some sim lens who are um, not private but um, belong to a people. Uh, but commons also extend to um, cultural wealth, for instance, or cultural and, and intellectual um, resources. And so, in the context of craft, there's there's uh, commons not just in sharing obviously materials and techniques, um, but also uh, sharing knowledge, sharing values, um, sharing a, a story, I think also could be uh, understood as a commons. And so uh, we were interested on, in how the work of these practitioners related to that notion a little bit. Um, and also, uh, I think commons also is, is linked to this, this notion of a group, of a community, and how this community has been impacted by the current pandemic. Um, how do people collaborate remotely? Um, how do they, they keep building communities online? Um, so that was another theme uh, that we had. And then uh, was there, and yeah, and so related to that, there was also this idea of local versus international networks. And all the practitioners here are in different parts of the world. Um, the practitioners were in another part of the world, and so how, what kind of communities do they build? Do they build on a local level, but also internationally with with other um, groups and practitioners? Oh, one last thing. So this is a roundtable. Um, so we're taking questions from the audience. Uh, please, if you have questions during the talk, write them in the um, conference chat, the rocket chat, and uh, Aphrodite and I will collect them and we will address them in order at the end of the session, at the end of the presentations. Cool, and with no further ado, I want to um, present our first uh, presenter, uh, Wei. So Sigwei Xie is a media artist based in Taipei that works with uh, wearables, e-textiles prototyping, and laser projector hacking. He's the founder of Tribe Against Machine, an experimental platform that aims to bring more attention to developing areas, minority ethnic culture, by organizing nomadic camps and labs. His current mission is to innovate a greenhouse in Tibet as a common ground for creating a biolab and providing food to the local community. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, so uh, I'm, my name is Zhi Weijie. I'm here to uh, give you a presentation of my practice and uh, how I grow networks with my own practice so um so today i want to show you quickly um some of my experiences and uh, how i work with those community but uh, actually i do everything in a, a amateur way and we are i'm just trying an ex experimental way so I'm also um, to explore the, uh, those topic. I'm the answer of the topics I'm working with now. So I start my uh, e-textile practice by this project, which is which was developed in uh, Oaxaca. Oaxaca is in, uh, it's a city in Mexico and it's very rich in textile culture. Um, I took a residency there. Um, by the time I was trying to just to uh, find a way to uh, embed it, a circuit onto textile. 
but uh, I'm not uh, I'm not from fashion uh, system, so I don't know sewing. So I uh, I use embroidery as my technique to sew circuits, and because of this um, practice, um, I accidentally went into a a community developer project which is led by Bandui Lab. And by the time they were visiting three villages in Anarko, it's another areas of Oaxaca. So that is the first time I combine my e-textile practice uh, with uh, some cultural uh, social design project. So basically what we do is just to explore to, to go to those villages and collaborate with them. I was there as a, um, I'm kind of like a, a just trying, they asked me to design a garment for action figures. And uh, what Ben do we do is like, um, they collect the natural material from this around the community and give workshops to those villagers and to convert the local uh, mythological action um, characters into design toys. So in this workshop, they, the, they are given a game, like a, uh, try to draw, draw out the mythological character in one minute. So they, they immediately um, uh, try to convert the figures in their mind into actual drawing. Um, I was there to design a LED circuit, um, multiplexing circuit for one of the action figures called uh, Adelita. So this is a pretty simple communi community develop de development project. So they also taught them to establish a physical shop and uh, they, they give each, um, they work with each village with um, different ways, depends on uh, each village's technique. So also, by the way, I, I accidentally met uh, one of the talker tonight, Amor Munoz there in Mexico City just to show them. Um, and then after this experience, I, I went back to Taiwan and I, cause, uh, I didn't find any e-textile uh, artist in Taiwan, so it's kind of uh, lonely. So I searched online, I found this e-textile summer camp community in France. And then I go there, I went there to uh, join their artist group uh, three years continuously. And from there, I uh, that was a really inspiring group, and I know I knew many um, artists there. So that is a very important process for my um, e-textile interest. But uh, um, but uh, during that workshop, during that uh, event, there's no one shows interest. Uh, really, no one really shows the interest for ethnic culture. But uh, in Taiwan, we are very, uh, it's a very familiar culture to us. So also plus my uh, previous experience in Mexico. So that is why I, um, in 2017 and 18, we, uh, we in, uh, invent this uh, event called the uh, Tribe Against Machine. We invited uh, uh, those, um, e-textile artists in summer camp and come to Taiwan to work with the Atayo tribe community. The, it's different, this experience is different from the experience in Oaxaca because this community is led by, this Atayo community is led by an artist and a cultural preservator called, uh, her name is Yoma Dalu. And uh, Yoma Dalu spent 20 years to um, to preserve uh, Atayo culture and uh, she and uh, her husband visited many museums in, in Europe. 
and they took picture and then they um, reconstruct the um, the lost pattern, the Atayo uh, woven pattern, by only by um, pictures. And she has uh, um, uh, she done a lot uh, with this um, uh, weaving pattern preservation and documentary. So in this event, uh, we host, we organized the eight workshop, the four workshops given by the e-textile artist and four by the Atayo community. So for example, like this one is the anthropologist, but he is not the, uh, he's amateur and anthropologist. And but he, he holds a very rich knowledge for Atayo uh, philosophy and the uh, spiritual mindset. And, and from there, we learn a lot of the, uh, the, the, the real culture of this tribe. And to me, this is a very different, um, very special event uh, to me because um, these two community has very different mindset where they can communicate with, uh, by the craft activities, like a weaving and textile embroidery. Also, they are from very, very different uh, society. And my, and like this workshop uh, that Yomataru is introducing the uh, patterns, uh, each patterns, the each uh, meanings of different Atayo pattern to the all the participants, and all these Atayo pattern are patented. As I know, this pattern uh, cannot be patented by only one man. It can only be the the patent can only be owned by a group of people, or the whole tribe. And the other workshop is like a. Uh, showcasing how to extract uh, the nature fiber they are using. And this is the founder of the Mika Satomi and also the other participant in Kuta. They are showing the very basic e-textile e knowledge to the participants. And so so this is the outcome of our workshop. So this is the uh, Atayo Bright headset, but it's reinvented into an e-textile wearable. I, I think uh, I remember Aphrodite holds it. Um, so in the middle is a lily pad and, in, and on top of it, it's the uh, Cooper uh, coils, which can detect a electronic, uh, electromagnetic field. So this is the e-textile artist they focus on the invisible forces as a EMF sensing and the, the Atayo culture, uh, they have this, explain this invisible force in a different way, but uh, together they are, they combines this. To me, this piece is a, it's a, it's a, it's a process of communication. The, and this work is from another artist, Aniela Ho. I think he should um, she focus on the biodegradable materials. So this is what she did in the uh, Tribal Against the Machine workshop. Inside this um, tape, it's the Rami fiber, and the back is a distant sensing uh, device, and the combined with all combined with gelatin. And this is another Atayo pattern, but in the middle is a silver coil. And uh, this is a work by Moton DB. It is uh, one of the participants. And this is an instrument which uh, converts the EMF to noise instrument. So, um, yeah, this is uh, Jonathan uh, Ruth's work. Uh, he is converting his ideas about this invisible uh, force, but uh, by uh, EVP device, but uh, embedded um, onto a Atayo headband. So that was the experience of the Atayo 
how I work with this uh, Tayo community. And I want to introduce you another community is called the uh, Hectaria. So I participated this Hectaria network because of uh, I met the founder, uh, Mark Duceo. And I, in this workshop, is a, um, it's called Warm Illusion. So this is another community which focused on bio, um, bio art and open source and um, temporary laboratory and the uh, workshop and knowledge sharing. And this network inspired me a lot because they run the community by sharing only by uh, sharing knowledge. And especially the Mark is, he is a kind of nomadic. He has this nomadic style. So he travels from uh, uh, Swiss to Indonesia and the India and Taiwan. So this network is holds very rich um, mindset, how to say, um, global mindset. So in this workshop, uh, for example, like it, uh, we were trying to convert the silk worm in to back into silicon by feeding the worm with PET. And I was there to try to use my technique is called the laser dye. I use laser dyeing to, to make this cyanotype type of photosynthesis. Um, I was just there try, I was trying to convert the warm, the, the sound of the warm eating PET into a, a laser cyanotype type piece. And so in this, I, I really like this network because they also have this craft, but the, this craft is not the ethnic craft. This is our all DIY uh, textile. Something, some devices are related to the textile. Like this one is a $10 electro spinning device. So, um, and also this uh, workshop given by Mark Dussel, he is showing the audience how to make bioplastic by Kassan. And also Kassan is a, a, a material for jewelry, but in the early of the 19th century, it's invented by a German, it's called the Galilis. I This is very inspired to me. And last network, last community is the uh, community in Tibet. But this is very, very, my personal, um, um uh, action yeah so uh i how i connect to, to this community is by building greenhouse um together with the community and i'm trying to link the greenhouse activity with some bio uh, knowledge so to bring trying to i was trying to come to invite artists who shares the interest for bio art and the botany and yeah for example like a, the local this is a blue flower a local flower but it's in blue color and it is and also this is a black moth wolfberry from the local and it is a material for DSSC, which is a uh, DSSC is a disensitized solar cell. So I, I was trying to use this as a um, um, tutorial for local kids education. Uh, and now uh, this is our the event we have, which is happening now because with now the COVID nineteen we cannot do all the physical workshop or action or uh, activity uh, I introduced before. So now we're doing this having friends in the future online. So we invite all different uh, participants from different network and uh, we are trying to innovate with NTCRI in Taiwan. It's a National Taiwan Craft Research and Development Institute. Um, now we are in the very early stage and we are still trying to um, find out the way.
and people are hold very different backgrounds from fashion and from e textile and from performance and uh, um, uh, some researchers so we, we don't know what we are going to uh, what will happen so now we are just doing talks and uh, technique sharing online so um, uh, this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Wei. Um, we'll we'll uh, pass to Amor Muñoz now. I'm going to introduce her. Amor was born in Mexico City in 1979. Her work across textiles, performance, drawing, sound, and experimental electronics explores the relationship between technology and society showing a special interest in the interaction between material forms and social discourse. She's particularly interested in how technology affects fabrication systems and how manual labor and handicrafts are changing in a contemporary global economy. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, everybody. Uh, OK, I will start with the presentation. Um, yes, my name is Amor, I'm from Mexico City, and I am a self-taught artist. Uh, my training uh, was as a lawyer. I went to the law school uh, for that reason. Uh, that's why I am uh, the maker culture, the tutorials, the do-it-yourself strategies are very important in my artistic process. Electronic textiles 10 years ago, and that time, in that time, sorry, in that in that time, I considered uh, considered with the work of Aphrodite, Shi Wei, and Constanza Pina. So it's very interesting how a global community that works with electronic and textiles has been created during all this time. So my early works uh, uh, was focused in the research about drawing uh, in the expanded. Uh, feel. What is drawing? A schematics is a series of works that link handmade embroidery with the symbolic representation of analog circuit diagrams. Uh, the project is an exhibition on large scale of schematic drawings that have been hand sewn with conductive thread and electronic components. So that uh, that circuits or drawings are full functional machines that can be operated by the public. So, with the binomial craftsmanship technology, I have been able to connect things that are not normally connected. I have been able to create works that have a balance uh, between poetics and functionality. Here we can see a uh, textile patterns with plissé or smoking technique, and the other side uh, a sound pattern. Uh, there are punch roll papers for player piano. So this is, for example, the how can we connect technology with uh, textiles, artisans with musicians, by example. And I'm start to create this project notes and folds. Uh, taking like inspiration, the works by Colin and Caro. This composer, uh, he was from the United States, and he was very famous to compose very complex uh, compositions in player piano. But the beautiful thing here is that he's not just a musician or composer; he's a programmer, and at the same time, he's an artisan because he punched the roll papers by hand. For example, in one year, he punched paper by hand just for 10 minutes of music. Uh, the other side, we have Morton Fieldman, this composer, a very famous colleague of uh, John Cage. Uh, he created different uh, symphonies and pieces uh, based on Persian carpets. So. It's very interesting how to find the relation between textile pattern and textile uh, and, and music pattern. So that's the, the final work. Uh, Not some fault, it's an interactive installation that aims to create connection between sound, form, programming, and craftsmanship. Uh, three cylinder, cylindrical uh, sound sculptures have been covered with plated textiles, uh, whose textures are made by a composer and translated in music patterns. The public activates the sculptures uh, with the hands 
approaching the hands to the fabric, making each cylinder rotate uh, in different uh, speeds, uh, producing sounds with different registers. In few words, the installation is a kind of special music instrument in which uh, plissé or pleated patterns work like a score. So this project was made in Paris with a group of artisans, uh, ladies from the Mobilier National. A other project that I want to share is uh, Matter and Memory. It's a project that I created in the residency in Bauhaus de Sao. And the project is inspired in the, on the Annie Albers works. Uh, it's very interesting because Annie Albers, she was a big fan of the pre-Columbian textiles. For her, the pre-Columbian textiles uh, were uh, codified a code uh, textiles. She found in that symbols or drawings, uh, different drawings, uh, different codes. Uh, every symbol, symbol means something. So she created different pieces with the notion of code, coding. And in, 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 in the same time, I relate that with the magnetic core memories. In general, the textile is considered like a memory, but in an anthropological way, not like a technological memory. So I work with uh, different artisans in Oaxaca to create different uh, textile pieces within, uh, but that textiles are real uh, technological uh, memories. I create a, a alphabet based on binary language, so I translate the zeros and ones in black and white to have that alphabet. And, and the fact in the moment that the artisans are weaving, they are coding. Is that reflection like that, that mentioned um, Richard Sennett, you know, that parallelism between artisan and programmer. So we can see uh, the different message secret message in that uh, that pieces and the beautiful thing in that piece is, is that our technological textiles and our interactive textiles too without technology the technology is the concept so the interaction between the public and the textile is a kind of data processing so i also discovered uh, that if I add in a social ingredient to the craft technology binomial, I can create narratives with social or political criticism, and also I can create utopias. So I will uh, show you uh, my first social project uh, 10 years ago, Maquila Region 4, uh, and that uh, project. Um, uh, is one of my first utopias. It's a factory that respects the human rights of workers and pays a pay is a good weight for their work. So Maquila Region 4 is a performatic intervention in the labor landscape of marginal areas of Mexico. The maquilas or factories are in the border towns uh, in, in the border of Mexico and the United States to provide raw materials and cheap labor, uh, mostly women, and the U.S. provides management and ownership. So Maquila is a mobile factory uh, for the manufacture electronics uh, artworks. This nomadic, nomadic uh, workshop travels to poor areas of Mexico, offering American minimum weight. Uh, in Mexico, the, the minimum weight is the 8%. Of the American way or salary. So it's a big difference, and for that reason, that American companies and factories go to Mexico to manufacture and pay a very bad salary. So people uh, sign um, an agreement uh, and they start to work uh, in the maquila, you know, like a normal factory. And after three or four hours, they finish the, the piece and they receive a good payment for uh, for the work. So this uh, project is a reflection about the labor and about the fact the production system that we never think about it, the workers. 
when you buy a product, you never think about the hands or the people that create it. You just think about materials, the brandy, the, the design, but we forget uh, that important part of the production system, the workers. So that piece is, uh, I add or attach a QR code and the people can uh, see the image, the photograph of the worker with all the information, how many hours he worked, uh, how many money he, uh, she, in this case, uh, she received you know, for uh, her work. I'm trying to create social conscience with that kind of projects. Another utopia uh, Another utopia is a community technology lab in the jungle to uh, technology access to the community and create technology with identity. So uh, six years ago, I moved to Yucatan in the peninsula uh, uh, to work with a group of ladies. They are artisans. They work with uh, lump or backstrap loop. Uh, with uh, organic uh, fibers, uh, and again, sisal. So, content which uh, seeks to create community uh, work to solve uh, local problems using low and high tech recourse, juxtaposing tradition and innovation. Uh, we appropriate technology. So the idea is to, to, to invent a local technology, uh, to use a solar panel, by example, with the culture of these people. It's not to use a, a strange artifact that they don't like or they don't feel connection. So when the people create, create their own, techn uh, own technology, uh, there, we can see a special or emotional link between the people and the technological object, the artifact. So here we have uh, uh, two ladies testing a big solar panel with sisal within, with flexible uh, solar, uh, solar cells and condu conductive thread. So it's very beautiful because we share a lot of knowledge. I learned to weave in with that material with them and they learn uh, about electronics. Uh, it's important to say that that ladies in that kind of communities, they have to ask permission to the husbands to work. So they are different, um, it's a different culture. So it's important to respect you know, uh, all the, the things around the community. And well, this is Yolanda, Yolanda Invent this uh, lamp uh, hot, for example, and everything is with LEDs, uh, conductive thread, and a battery that, you, that they can charge with the solar panel. Now they invent other things like that shoes. So I created that different laboratories. This is in, in Chiapas. So I use the same pattern of labs, but the results are different everything depends on context and the needs of the people. No? So in that case, uh, we have guys and girls working. Uh, all the guys in that community, they weave in and they embroider, they knitting. Uh, so, so it's interesting the gender uh, issue here, the gender topic here. Sorry, my English. <laughs> so we can see uh, they invent this to 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 light the way in the night because they, they live in the mountains so it's very important and they don't have electricity there so it's important for them to have light when they are walking the, the last by example the last uh, lab that i made is with uh, the auto lab uh, is auto lab because the, this group of indigenous ladies are otomi it's a kind of group, it's a, a group uh, very close to Mexico City. So they immigrate to, the, to Mexico uh, to, to live, uh, looking for a better life, but it's very hard to be indigenous person in Mexico City. It's super hard. So they survive uh, selling that dolls. Uh, that's a Maria is the name of that handcraft. 
Uh, but the problem that they have is the, the price now is very cheap. Nobody wants to pay more of eight or ten dollars for the doll. So they they were very interested about the, the lab to make a photovoltaic uh, dolls and and sell it in a better price. So they were working during one month, uh, learning and creating that edition of dolls, and they create that beautiful dolls with LEDs, and that dolls are a kind of lamp. Uh, and the back side with a flexible solar cell. And it's very interesting this case because we can see, we can broke the, the idea, the general idea that the people have that the tradition is a enemy of technology. Technology is enemy of tradition. But in this case, no. Uh, we can see that technology give more value uh, to the product. So I believe that we can use technology to conserve, to preserve, and to give a plus value to the handcraft. So it's, it's all, it's all the, the work that, that I want to, to, to share with you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amor. Um, People are asking for uh, links, so if you could add some of the links of your projects, uh, Michael Arion Quattro and Yucatec in the chat, that'd be great. Um, so we continue with uh, Constanza Piña and Melissa Aguilar. Uh, Constanza Piña is a visual artist, dancer, and researcher focused on electronic experimentation, free technologies, and social practices. Her work reflects on the role of machines in culture, criticizing capitalism and the techno-patriarchic system, interested in recycling, handicrafts, and electronic wizardry. In her sound project, Corazon de Robota, she explores the field of audible and inaudible frequencies as physical perceptions and noise. Constanza is the organizer of the techno-feminist meeting Cyber Girls in Mexico City. And graphic designer, artistic researcher, Melissa Aguilar is a collaborator of Cyber, Cyber Girls. She's a student of the Master of Graphic Design at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, faculty of art and design and member of the ICOM in Costa Rica. Melissa is dedicated to art and tech, new media, museums and art education. Her projects seek to bring together museums and maker spaces in order, in order to enhance visitors' experience through immersive practices. So I'll give the presentation over to you guys now. All right. Hi, everyone. to Aphrodite for this invitation. Um, um, I am Constanza Piña from Chile. Um, and yes, I am from me and Melissa Aguilar. We want to talk about uh, Cyborg Girls. Uh, uh, Cyborg Girls is a techno feminist meeting that we organized from 2017 um, here in Mexico. And our idea was to uh, bring together women and no binary technologies. And we want to think about technologies. Uh, Dance. So, um, recreate the idea of technology and thinking and in the book and in hierarchies in technology, you know, as high level versus. And the main idea of this meeting is from feminist speculation in Latin America. Melly, mm -hmm. you want to add something? Mm -hmm. 
maybe you're muted. Okay, there we go. So yeah, as Constanza said, we've been celebrating this meeting since 2017, and we've grown a lot. And um, uh, we believe that craft is one of the aspects that unite us as, as community. Um, and um, we've, we're going to talk about a little bit more of that, of our craft now, if you want to take it over, Constanza. Okay, well, um, let's talk about some of our craft. Uh, we have this project called the Cyber Girls Multiverse, um, which is like the Multiple Words University, and we consider this a space of sharing and knowledge for feminist technologies. And our craft is very diverse. In the workshops, we create electronic devices, scenes, collage, tattoos, more like traditional, but we also have like animation, biohacking, life coding, gynecology, we sell and learn how to use free software and many other things. Then refer to the notion of commons in the meeting. Uh, first of all, like, we believe in the internet as a common resource and therefore we advocate for free internet and the defense of our digital rights. Uh, we teach workshops about digital security, we make install parties, we reflect upon about the internet, its privatization and the need to defend freedom on the virtual realm. So that's why we teach these kind of workshops. Uh, and our workshops are open. We want them to be a common to which anyone has access to. So they are activities of accessible coast, uh, meaning like, yeah, our workshops and our meeting is like a common. Um, and also like it is made out of the effort of all the participants, like everybody brings their, their gear and their working materials and their shared their knowledge and research. So we see like all the knowledge in the meeting as a common in itself. Also, um, we really feel like we are not just making a contribution to the idea of the commons. Instead, it's something we already have like incorporated in our culture. Like the idea of common is part of our education in Latin America. Almost, it's almost like in an invisible way because it's so much embedded in our culture and in our daily practices. Uh, for example, we see this in like the economy of the home, the system of caring, food, shared knowledge, and some other things. And somehow we still follow this ancient principle of summa kasai, which is a Quechua word that means well living. It's translated as well living or to live well in harmony, abundance, and balance. Uh, and this is an alternative paradigm to capitalist development. And it also implies to take and share without accumulating. And it implies that life is collective. So that is kind of like the idea of the commons in Cyber Girls. Um, as the need us uh, as a community uh, because we feel that we need to be together and do things together and craft to craft together and learn together and it's important uh, 
for for us, our meeting is a technology itself. It's a spare share ideas and affection, and and also we uh, thinking uh, craft to craft together is. and communication and for for us it's important for example include women in, uh, in practices uh, that exclusively for men and also we want to uh, for knowledge or practices of our grandmas, uh, and because we want to bring uh, them back and mix them with contemporary Also, in, in a spiritual and political value of uh, to craft, uh, because now after colonialism we have a lot of capitalist and extractivist ideas uh, in our practices. Um, so we want to recover the value of, of the craft. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we also believe in decolonizing by breaking hierarchies in the practices that we make. So uh, we believe to in the possibility to decolonize to through technological appropriation to rethink the dominant notions about technology, as Constanza said, like yeah, about high and low tech, uh, we stand against the patriarchal impositions that tell us what tech we can and can't use, um, trying to go against gender roles, and we put on high esteem the miscalled low technologies, the ancestral wisdom, witchcraft, cooking, drawing. So for example, here we have a picture of a workshop that was called The Force of Things, which is which was about witchcraft, technology, and re-signification by Raquel Ramirez Salgado in 2018. And likewise, we promote and teach the usage of free software and open code technologies from a feminist and political approach. Uh, so, for example, we gave uh, workshops about the political notion of the co of coding and life coding for beginners. These were a couple of workshops taught by Irene Soria and Marianne Teixido back in 2019. And um, now Constanza is going to talk a little bit about the hack feminism and how it's related to decolonizing. Uh, we introduced some uh, workshops and practices about hacking and uh, stories, uh, physical and also digital. And we want to reappropriate or reclaim these spaces for us. Uh, starting from our body as a primordial space. Okay. Um, we um, also believe that we decolonize in alternative way in promoting alternative ways ways of living to the patriarchal system. So. Uh, we believe in craft as a vehicle to decolonize our bodies, 
uh, through DIY gynecology workshops. Like uh, we had a workshop about Hinepunk with uh, um, and Jelly Pin in 2017. And we also have biohacking um, workshops as the transplant workshop with Chimera Rosa that we have in 2018. And we also teach sexual education workshops. And um, overall, uh, Cyber Girls Techno Feminist Meeting is a technology for the decolonization in, of the body. As Constanza was saying, uh, the meeting is a decolonizing technology in itself, and we do this. Do we do this by just getting together and dancing and yeah, having uh, the meeting in itself. Also, we do nice research uh, about uh, me medicinal plants as cannabis. And yes, for, for us, it's important to recognize traditional uh, practices from Latin America. <laughs> Okay, then so um, related to the cyber aspect of cyber girls um, is founding initiatives related to computation and virtuality mostly. Um, in the case of computation, we teach workshops about digital security, as we said before, digital self-defense and how to use tools such as Tor and Tails. And we reflect upon digital freedom and care. We also have the Cyborg Cinema, which is a showcase of videos made by our virtual community that don't necessarily assist physically to the meeting. And the cinema travels as a sub-product of the meeting and has been shown in other countries by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and about uh, the cyber aspect of the craft that we use, uh, we are always trying to, to use free software and, and also uh, we teach a workshop about um, a digital security or digital self-defense and also we we uh, do a editaton of, of wikipedias to add more women uh, in the internet on the cyberspace mm -hmm. Ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what happened this year with Cyber Girls with the current pandemic? Um, well, Cyber Girls got postponed this year due to COVID 19, and under these circumstances, we decided that it was time to um, organize our archive, which is what, what we are currently doing, working on the archive. And during this process of organizing, we have seen how big and necessary our community is and how much we have grown since we started, uh, since the first edition in 2017. And uh, now our community consists of approximately 160 cyber girls from 14 countries. We've grown a lot. And um, for, for the... To, to reflect upon this, we made a press release uh, when this whole crazy time was starting, uh, because we really feel that it's very important to meet physically, and if we cannot do it, then it wasn't very easy to migrate to, to the virtual realm, the, to migrate to the virtual realm, this meeting, because uh, getting together physically for us is very important. So 
right now we are doing that we're just working on the archive and we we are growing it it's really big it's a really nice project and um do you want to add anything to that constanza that's okay <laughs> thank you <Melinda. laughs> okay. so yeah so you can visit us on cybergirls.wordpress.com and see our archive growing and hopefully we'll be able to celebrate our meeting next year we'll see well, thank you so much for the presentation on cyborg girls and we're gonna quickly go to our next presenter who is audrey briot uh, textile designer and technology technologist audrey briot is co-founder of data Polet a collective and hacker space focused on research and development in textiles and digital technologies. Her work is dedicated to the impact of emerging technologies on the preservation of textile savoir faire. She is focusing on nonverbal communications transmitted by textiles, which represent for her a substitute of writing. She relies on anthropological researches to, uh, in order to formulate textiles as memory vectors, adding data and interactivity. Yes, so thank you, Aphrodite, and thank you, Gabrielle, for organizing and moderating this, um, this round table. And thank you to our networks for organizing this event. So, um, yes, thank you. Um, yes, so, uh, ooh. Sorry. I don't know what's happening. Um, okay, it doesn't matter. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> stay like this. Okay, so, um, yeah, I want, I will uh, introduce you um my practice in the way but i think it's based on things um for this reason in fact um when i refer to, to craft i refer to um i refer in fact to my practice in like how to uh, master craftsmanship in textile and how this way if you master them uh, you can use them as a medium for communication um, in this way, I also con like so I consider that textile as a as a medium for communication, and but also if you decide to buy a T-shirt in uh, mass markets, in fact you you share a message with your community, so you're also part of a community. So I was thinking, and I'm thinking that if you own the tools to create these textiles, you can make into your textile. You can incorporate your own data. You can incorporate your own images and messages and this way you can step aside from the the consumer society and you can choose your own community so um it strangely i discovered six years ago uh what was the amazing ecosystems of aka spaces um like um so here you can see the black loop which is which was an aka space based in paris um six years ago and in this hackerspace, you can see, for me, what, what you can see in any hackerspace around the world. You can see so many boxes with so many things. You can see so many cables, computer, uh, soldering station, components, everything. So many things that the space make the space, in fact, the space is shaped by everyone for everyone. And I was in this space making textiles with electronics, with few people, and we have a small space there. And then we decided to go to to the to Schmidt Festival, which is um, a festival in Austria, which is happening almost now. And there, it was something big for me because I was almost to meet Anna and Mika, which are the organizer of the eTextile summer camp. And in the past, I didn't knew this thing. And at Schmidt, there was a small space where I met Aphrodite, and we were making textile and 
this was so crazy and we were also crazy with people from Paris. So in the way back, we decided to create a space, a hacker space dedicated to textiles. And we were thinking about the name and we decided to call this hacker space Data Polette because uh, as you can guess, we were referring data to the everything which is contemporary and technology. And Paulette was, is, was the name of my grandmother. And we were thinking this would represent all the craftsmanship and all the heritage uh, of textile we own in France. Uh, and we will mix these things together. So we did it and this, uh, okay, so this was the inspiration from us. This is the e-textile summer camp, one moment there. And then this is what we did. So here is the Tapolet, um, a few years ago now. So as you can see, it looks like every aqua space. So you can see so many things on the space. And but we have some knitting machine. We have loom. We have yarns. We have textiles and sewing stations. So we mix the things that you can find in the aqua space usually with uh, things from textile. And um, so something important is that you can imagine in Paris having a non-profit organization as Data Polet is something difficult. So we, have, we are renting some space for very cheap for a few years. And then the buildings are destroyed or used for something else. And so these things cause that we have to move, move very often. So also every time we move, we change the shape of the space. So, for example, here something sad was that the actor space, the black loop, was in was downstairs, and it was kind of far from us, and it was very sad. So then we moved to the next space, and we have this very nice space where the actor space is just behind the glass, behind the window there. So it was nice. It was nicer. Uh, the space was very, very, very nice, and. Something important with the aqua space is that because it's aqua space, it needs to be very open, open to everyone. So we organize the space in the way that we are open every Wednesday. But this, oops, this is not always um, in the in the spring, and because also it's difficult for us to be there and every day because we work, we have our own life, or I was studying in the past, and so. Here you can see the atmosphere on Wednesday evening, and we, we were trying to recreate this very often, but it was difficult. And something which was happening is that the collaborative side is something difficult to keep in something well balanced. And sometimes we were becoming kind of consultant in a textile for people, and this was not the idea. So we were also losing the exchange we can make between the members together. So. Lately, we changed again, <laughs> we moved to another building. And there, we decided to create the space in another way. We came back with our friend from the Aqua Space, and we shared the space all together. And this way, we decided to, to change our opinion and say that Data Polet became more a collective, where we can collaborate with the core members. And there is the Aqua Space with everything inside. And we are totally available and welcome to collaborate with everyone. And so this thing was important for me to show because um, something something else was that in this in this moment I was giving a lot of workshop with knitting machines when with that applet. And so it means that I was carrying my every knitting machine from the 80s and bringing it in different spaces with um, young people, kids adults, very different, different people. And the idea was to show them that this very old thing was able to discuss with my computer. So um, this way means that uh, we can, I was trying to show them that, for example, uh, selfies, they can be embedded into textile. And people are reacting like, wow, this thing, which looks like my grandmother, is able to need some brands or some very cool things. And so, um, the idea behind this to, was also to bring the vision of Data Polet outside of the building and of our building and to show that if we can put tools in common, we can share resources and we can create very new things and step aside from the consumer society. So 
I was, uh, it was very important for me to show this example because also I think something interesting was that um, DataPolet is um, with the co-founder, but for me, DataPolet is a kind of lifelong project because it's my maybe my first project I did. And um, I hope to keep it going and make it evolve with different situations. And in a way, it was also interesting because uh, because it was one of my first projects, it was difficult for me to say, because everything is so collaborative in my work, which, what's, what is mine? <laughs> what is mine in my work? And I think this is something interesting to discuss, because when you make things with so many people in communities, um, it's a question, question which appears. And it's very nice also that the space is changing, and so now it, it's evolving every time. So thank you. <laughs> Cool. Um, thank you, Audrey. Um, we're, we didn't miscalculated the time, so we only have time for one more presentation. And maybe uh, if people have questions for our presenters, they can add them in the chat. So with no further ado, I'm going to present the last but not least of our uh, speakers today, Heidi Biggs. Heidi is a design researcher pursuing a PhD in human computer interaction and design at the Indiana University in Bloomington. Biggs uh, uses research through design to playfully explore ways technologies can make climate change more tangible and support slow place-based ecological understanding. See, they also sew and weave soft sonic wearables to performatively explore feelings of gender non-binariness. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, so, number one, thanks for everyone who went before me. All of these presentations were absolutely super fascinating, and I loved hearing them. And thanks to uh, Aphrodite for organizing this and our networks for having us. This is super cool. Um, so yeah, let me think about how I want to present this. I guess I can push play and just exist in the void with myself. Um, so my name is Heidi Biggs. As Aphrodite mentioned, I'm a design researcher. And unlike a lot of the other presenters, I have sort of like a maybe slightly different background just coming from, um, I'm a first year PhD student, so my research is young. And I am have a background in English literature and design. So I don't have such an established craft practice as some of the people, but I have found craft to be like a very powerful medium for research for myself. Um, so I think I was drawn to e-textiles because one of my guiding research questions um, was how does ubiquitous technology interact with me as a body and what does it mean for me as a body? As someone who's like really enjoyed performance art and dance in the past, um, I wanted to surface how technology is like always in contact with the body. And I think I've used textiles and e-textiles in my view foreground, A, embody knowledge and examine binaries, like between brain and body, male and female, homosexual, heterosexual, and nature and culture. And I think all of these binaries live in kind of a synergy with each other where what is natural and what is unnatural is also like deeply related to what is and isn't okay like sexually or like how you express your gender etc um so i guess my plan was to just briefly touch on some projects that i've done and then like give a meta reflection on some of the topics of networks and communities that they've helped me build and all new knowledge and then um because my research is like younger i'm almost coming from the perspective of the person benefiting from all the amazing <laughs> work of the people who presented before um with like a more of a design lens so it's interesting um so the first project i was just going to talk really briefly is my master's thesis and this was my introduction to e-textiles and i created this artifact called the high water pants which you can see in this photograph, they're like mono yellow wet, weird pants that I made for cyclists, for cyclists themselves to engage with the possible ways that sea level rise was going to impact them in the future. Um, so like 
these pants give tactile sensation inside of certain areas in Seattle. Um, let me see if I have a good picture. I built this sort of like soft circuit um, that runs a live GPS coordinates like tracker. And as soon as you go inside of these like red zones in Seattle, Washington, um, the pants lever raises up and it creates this tactile sensation on the cyclist's leg. And my idea was like, um, data from climate change is so abstract and I wanted to make it extremely tangible. Um, but the data points I was using are from like 30 to 80 years in the future. So I was like, what does it do? What are like the implications of having this ta tactile feedback when um, you can kind of experience something in the present and the future at the same time, it's sort of like time traveling through embodied knowledge. And I thought like embodied knowledge was really special, a special way to experience data about something very important, but also very untangible. And um, so I also was really interested in, there's a conversation in the design community right now, I think about the importance of understanding how knowledge is tac tacit knowledge is still knowledge, the importance of knowing through making. And I think that's extremely inspired by the crafting community. Like craft is a way of making, um, knowing to make and make, to know and also like the knowledge of craft is kind of a common knowledge and it's something that we do pass amongst ourselves um, but that's like somehow kind of like not um, not as how to say like legitimate and so I'm trying to like legitimize this type of knowledge through my research so I wrote a pictorial for this about the things I learned through crafting and I also just wanted to share a reflection on this experience where um, I really got, um, like I really got aware that I, this was the first time in my life that I'd ever had access to this type of information, like how electronics worked or how, um, like how mechanical engineering worked. And I was like really kind of angry because I felt like these were the building blocks of the world that I was, just only integrate, like just only learning about in my thirties. And um, I was like, you know, crafting actually offers this sort of like different entry point to these types of knowledges. That is something I found like had never had access to before. So I thought that was really important for me. Um, and these spaces are really important for like allowing a different way of knowing these type of like electronics, mechanical engineering, things like that to come about. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about this other project that I did really briefly called Racquetball Score. And this was a performance that I created out of uh, live sound that I generated from playing a game of racquetball. Um, but it was a way that I was exploring my own personal feelings of gender non-binariness through noise performance. And I was sourcing sound from different elements in a like, game of racquetball that I created on stage. And the main kind of like idea for this was that I created this set of shorts that um, I built into a pair of, yeah, I built this like sound pickup into a pair of shorts. And I was wanting to make white noise from my crotch area because I was like, I don't want to be red. I don't want this transmission from my like, gen my sexual, like organs to be received. Like I want it to be ambiguous and I don't want to be able to be read that way. And then I was like also taking sound from the tape that I laid down on the floor and also my racquetball, it's a uh, racket itself and channeling it all through this sort of like live feedback and a mixer to work with live feedback as well. And I found that I was managing sort of this live interact like system of sounds that were all interacting with each other. And it was like a really, uh, that became part of the piece too, was just like managing the complexity of all these sort of signals I was putting out. Um, and I got to perform this at Design Trouble, which was a symposium that Aphrodite helped organize and is also a place I met some of the other presenters in this uh, panel. And it was held at the University of Washington. It was called Design Trouble. And uh, yeah, I got to present that piece for the first time there and meet a bunch of really cool people. 
Um, and then I also presented it at a performing arts venue in Seattle. And to workshop it, I used a gallery space in the basement of the art building to practice getting ready for presenting it on a bigger stage. Um, and I decided that to get feedback, I wanted to have this sort of like secret basement art night. So I invited friends from my design program, the MFA program, and the DX Arts program, and we all got together and three different people performed and we all gave each other feedback. So it was this cool like interdisciplinary in the arts night of presenting work. And this is one of the MFA students doing a performance where they used um, yarn to perform care. And they knit me <laughs> a little like finger sock. It was really fun. This was like one of my favorite experiences of my masters, I think was this night in the basement. Um, and then more recently, I'm still working on a couple of things that I wanted to share and share some reflections. Um, I'm also trying to build a tube that helps me express my gender non-binariness again. And this tube, I want to be like a body sized synthesizer that I can play from the inside out. So I've built a prototype with stretch sensors that are attached to, uh, or like that as you stretch this fabric, this is like an infinity scarf prototype, the sound quality changes. And my goal is to create a bigger version. This is me working in Aphrodite Studio, um, making a bigger version, uh, a bigger piece of fabric to prototype more with. And I think this is something that's become really interesting to me is like forms that I can inhabit and sounds that I can make that are pre gendered like proto forms and proto sounds and that's been a big piece of my research recently um and then i just wanted to talk about too like as a student as someone inhabiting these spaces and like building community i i find this is like the university of washington's fab lab um and as a person who like is interested in performance and embodied knowledge i just wanted to share and the way that I built community, um, I just wanted to share these images because they really show like how much space and how messy uh, work can be. And I find that so important. Um, like I especially wanted to share this picture of me working on the ground because, um, and I wanted to share a picture of Rehards because I feel like <laughs> Rehards is someone that I sat next to all the time and I feel like you know, I built a relationship with Rehards in a really like, uh, like in a way that was just like, I'm around this person all the time and we're making stuff together and we're not like looking at each other and talking. We're more just like working in the same space. And I think that's like a really unique way to build relationships. And I think it's a really unique way to build knowledge to like work on the ground on a project that's asking questions. Um, and then in Indiana, since the pandemic, um, when I first moved here, I just wanted to say this really quickly because I've been thinking about it a lot. I made, I tried really hard when I got here to make friends with people in the fibers department because I was like, I really want to keep working in fibers. Like this is a really cool community. Um, and I made one friend <clears throat> who I'm still hanging out with all the time. And she's one of my like cornerstones in the pandemic. And she's a fiber artist. And together we've started sort of like a research project or like a research agenda to examine seeds as technology um, and how seeds are kind of like the basis of a lot of fiber arts. And um, there's sort of an, a hybridization of our two research agendas, like me asking a question about like how a seed is a, histor a technology that carries like histories of culture and like her asking how like, we often like talk about craft and how we build knowledge through making. Um, but I also noticed that part of our community that we've built, which is very small, <laughs> just the, the two of us, um, is we hang out on her porch and we craft together. We like embroider and bead and stuff. And thinking a lot about um, the type of interaction that that allows. Um, and I've been thinking about it in terms of like a psychoanalytic couch where you are sitting with someone, talking to someone, but your brain has the space to free associate that's like pretty, special and unique, a way to like think with somebody while you're crafting. And I think that was just one of the questions I've had in my mind is like, how does the, how does the me mechanics of making and touching something while you're talking, uh, and like 
having this space for your brain to kind of like spread out and be all over the place while you're making somebody, making something alongside somebody affect community and relationships. Um, yeah, so that's it. I wanted to end as quickly as I could without being too short, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone for like sharing your, your work and uh, the works that you currently like um, work with and hopefully this this introduction also to the public the people that are were following the talks would be like an entry point to this like wonderful world of electronic textiles and um yeah uh, we unfortunately didn't have enough time to ask questions and have a conversation but please feel free to um send us your questions in the rocket chat and yeah, or email us directly, or all, all our information is um, on on our website, on our network's website. And thank you so much to Sarah and everyone else at our networks for having us. Yeah, thank you.